In this introductory video, I like to give some impression for what people mean when they talk about abstract algebra. Now, because this video is mostly conceptual, I like to start with just a couple of disclaimers. The first disclaimer is that most of what I'm going to talk about in this video is going to be presented in a way that should not be considered mathematically rigorous. So for example, I'm going to talk about binary operations and groups and rings and fields, but I'm not going to give the mathematical definitions of what those are. That will come in later videos. The second disclaimer is that you may not yet understand some of the objects and the symbols that I'm going to use in this video, but that's okay. The purpose of the video is just to give you an impression for what this subject is about. If there are some things here that you don't understand, you're going to learn about them in later videos. And then if you want, you can come back and watch this video to try to understand the parts that you didn't get the first time. So what is abstract algebra? Well, one way to try to answer that question is to say that it's the study of two things. Number one, sets with algebraic structure satisfying certain properties. And number two, maps between these sets which respect the algebraic structure. This is a somewhat vague description, and so in order to make it a little more precise without giving the actual definition, what exactly do we mean by algebraic structure? Well, we could mean that there's some rule like addition or multiplication, or maybe some other more abstract binary operation, which takes two elements of our set and produces another element. Now, not every rule like that is going to satisfy all of the properties that we need in order to define whatever object we're studying. And so this extra little phrase, certain properties, is pretty important. And those certain properties are something that we're going to have to specify in later lectures. I'll give you an example later in this lecture of a map between two sets with algebraic structure satisfying certain properties, which respects the algebraic structure. But as a preview of what's to come, the kind of maps that I'm talking about here are what are referred to as homomorphisms. Again, without getting into details of definitions, let me go ahead and try to show you some examples of the kind of sets that we study in abstract algebra, and of some maps between these sets which respect the algebraic structures. The integers together with addition satisfies a lot of nice properties. Addition is associative, it's even commutative, there's a special integer called zero with the property that when I add it to any other integer, it doesn't change the other integer. And also for every integer, there's a negative of the integer with the property that when I add an integer to its negative, I get zero. You don't need to worry about all those properties that I just mentioned. They're going to come up again in later videos when we talk about binary operations and definitions of groups and abelian groups. There are lots of other familiar examples like this. The rationals together with addition, the reals together with addition, and the complex numbers together with addition. And all of these are basic examples of what are called groups. Now there are other familiar binary operations on these sets that we can use to create groups. So for example, it turns out that the positive rational numbers together with multiplication, or the positive real numbers together with multiplication, also form what are called groups. Now you need to be a little bit careful. There's a reason why I'm considering the positive rational numbers and the positive real numbers here. Once I give you the definition, you'll see that the collection of all rational numbers or the collection of all real numbers together with multiplication doesn't actually form a group. Anyway, these are all some of the more familiar examples of groups, but there are also lots of other examples that may be less familiar to some people. For example, if we take the integers modulo 10, or if you're a computer scientist, you can just think about this as the remainders 0 to 9 when you divide a whole number by 10. That collection of remainders, together with the operation of addition modulo 10, also forms a group called the additive group of integers modulo 10. Now, like I said in the disclaimers, if you don't really understand what this is talking about, you don't need to worry too much about it right now. Groups like this are going to be some of our first examples after we nail down the definition of a group. Another important example of a group is the collection of all polynomials with real coefficients together with addition of polynomials. This is a set with algebraic structure. The algebraic structure is addition of polynomials, and it turns out to satisfy all the nice properties that it needs to satisfy in order to be called a group. Another example of a group which may be familiar to some people is the collection of two by two real matrices. That means matrices with real coefficients with determinant not equal to zero, together with the binary operation of multiplication of matrices. And to give you a final example, which may be less familiar to a lot of people, take any set S and then consider the power set of that set. That is the collection of all subsets of S together with the binary operation of 
symmetric difference. In other words, our set here is the power set of a set S, and our algebraic structure or binary operation is the operation which takes two subsets of S and then forms the symmetric difference of the two sets. This also turns out to be an example of a group. If you don't fully understand this example, that's okay. My real reason in showing you all of these examples is to show you that there are many more abstract objects besides the familiar ones, which can all be studied using the machinery of group theory. Now, besides groups, there are also other kinds of objects that we study in abstract algebra. Two of the most common ones are what are called rings and fields. Rings are just sets with two different binary operations that both behave nicely and are also compatible with each other in a certain sense. In a lot of the examples that we gave of groups, there's not only a familiar operation of what we would call addition, but also one of what we would call multiplication. And it turns out that in all the examples that I've listed here, when we consider these sets together with their addition and multiplication operations, they form what are called rings. Fields are just special examples of rings, which are especially nicely behaved under the multiplication operation. Not all of the rings that we've listed here turn out to be fields, but three of them are. The integers together with addition and multiplication is a ring but not a field, and the collection of polynomials with real coefficients together with addition and multiplication is also a ring but not a field. The collection of integers modulo 10 together with addition and multiplication is also a ring but not a field. But just so you don't think things are too easy here, it turns out that the integers modulo 11 together with addition and multiplication is a field. Hopefully that gives you a little flavor of the kinds of objects that we study in abstract algebra. Next, what do we mean by maps between these sets which respect the algebraic structure? Let me give you just a couple of examples. First of all, let's consider the map psi from the group of real numbers under addition to the group of positive real numbers under multiplication, defined by the rule that psi of a real number x is e to the x. Choose your favorite real numbers x and y in the domain, and think about what the function psi does to the real number x plus y. Of course, by the definition of psi, that's equal to e to the x plus y, and by properties of the exponential function, that's equal to e to the x times e to the y. Well, again, by the definition of psi, that's equal to psi of x times psi of y. Now, notice that psi has taken two real numbers which were added together in the domain, and it's mapped them to the product of their images in the codomain. That's an example of what we mean when we say that the map respects the algebraic structures in the domain and in the codomain. And this map psi is what we would call a homomorphism of groups. Now for a second example, consider the map phi from the group of integers under addition to the group of integers modulo 10 under addition, defined by the rule that phi of an integer is equal to the integer modulo 10. If you're not comfortable with modular arithmetic yet, you can skip this example if you think it's confusing. However, if you know a little bit about modular arithmetic, then you're going to realize that for any pair of integers n and m, when you add n and m together and then compute phi of the sum, you get the same thing as when you compute phi of n and add it to phi of m. This is just saying that addition of residue classes is well-defined modulo 10. We'll revisit this and talk about it in more detail in a later lecture. For the purposes of this lecture though, what you're supposed to notice is that phi is taking a sum of two integers in the integers, and it's mapping it to a sum of two integers modulo 10. Now, even though these plus signs look the same, Technically, they represent different binary operations. The plus sign on the left is the addition of two integers in z, and the plus sign on the right is the addition of two integers modulo 10. The main point here is that phi is a homomorphism from the collection of integers under addition to the collection of integers modulo 10 under addition. Finally, I'd like to say something about the historical motivations for the development of the subject into the form that we have it in today. It's not the case that people just came up with this definition of a group one day and started to study it. Rather, what happened is that first people discovered naturally occurring examples of groups in different settings, and later they realized that all of these different algebraic structures could be studied systematically under the auspices of this one definition. Of course, it's a similar story with rings and fields and the other algebraic structures that we study in this subject. So where did groups first arise? Well, roughly speaking, they firstly came from two main categories of problems. The first is the study of symmetries of certain sets of objects. To give two of the main examples here, 
First of all, there was Galois' study of symmetries of roots of polynomials in conjunction with his proof of the insolvability of the quintic. Now, I don't have a lot of time to go into detail here, but this is a very interesting problem. A lot of you may know something about it already, but it's historically at the crux of a lot of parts of mathematics. And in fact, it was Galois who first used the word group to describe these types of objects. The second place where you see this theme in a naturally occurring way is in the study of symmetries of certain geometric objects. A very basic example, which we're going to study later, are groups of symmetries of rigid motions of regular polygons in the plane. As an example, in this picture, I've illustrated all of the rigid motions or isometries of an equilateral triangle in the plane. Starting from a given equilateral triangle, you can rotate it by 2 pi over 3, then you can rotate it by 2 pi over 3 again, and if you rotate it by 2 pi over 3 again, you arrive at the original triangle. The other type of rigid motion that you can do is you can reflect the triangle about an altitude passing through the top vertex. That reverses the orientation and gives you a triangle like the one on the bottom. Then, if you rotate that triangle by 2 pi over 3 and then by 2 pi over 3 again, you get two different orientations of the original triangle. Well, we're going to say more about this example in a later video, but this is a very basic example of a set on which you can define a very natural binary operation, which turns it into a group. There are similar groups of symmetries for other regular polygons and for shapes in higher dimensions. These are things that occur naturally in many branches of mathematics, as well as applications to physics and other parts of the sciences. The second category of problems that motivated the systematic study of groups and related algebraically defined objects are problems coming from number theory. For example, problems about the integers modulo n or related groups. Historically, a lot of these types of problems arose in the context of pure mathematics, but in modern times they have applications to lots of different problems in cryptography, computer science, and many other parts of mathematics and the sciences. Just to give you a very simple example of the types of problems I'm talking about, let's try to determine what the units digit of 3 to the power 2023 is. I think a lot of you who have either done contest math or taken elementary number theory will already have some idea how to do this problem. One sort of hands-on, unsophisticated solution is just to make a table of all of the powers of 3 modulo 10. So 3 to the first is 3, 3 squared is 9, 3 cubed is 7. Remember, we're working modulo 10, so we can replace any integer here by its remainder after dividing by 10. And then we continue in this way, at each step multiplying the number on the previous level by 3 and reducing mod 10. That means that the next number in the list, 3 to the 4th mod 10, is going to be 1. And now that we've gotten to 1, the list repeats itself. It goes 3, 9, 7, and then 1 again, and so on. The point here is that the powers of 3 mod 10 are periodic with period 4. So that allows us, by some elementary algebra using properties of exponents and working modulo 10, to write 3 to the 2023 as 3 to the 4th to the 505, times 3 cubed, which modulo 10 is 1 to the 505 times 7. That gives 7 mod 10, and it allows us to conclude that the units digit of 3 to the 2023 is 7. Now once we understand a little bit of elementary group theory, we can also see that there's a very simple explanation of what's going on in the language of group theory. So first of all, we're working in a group which I haven't mentioned yet, which is the group of invertible residue classes modulo 10. Remember my general disclaimer in this video, you don't have to worry about what that is right now. I'll explain in detail what it is in a later video. Well, there's a very important theorem in group theory that says that the order of any element in a finite group has to divide the number of elements in the group. The number of elements in this group turns out to be four. So from the point of view of elementary group theory, it's not a surprise at all that the powers of three are periodic with period four. This gives us a more fundamental way of understanding what's going on in this problem, and it's also an idea that we can generalize to many more abstractly defined groups. That's the end of this video. I hope it gave you some impression for what this subject is about. Next time we're going to start to lay the foundation for more rigorous considerations by talking about sets and subsets.